Hello, my name is Angela Wallace. Um, I run a consultancy, Atlantic Archaeological Services, in Enniscrown in County Sligo, and I'm going to be talking to you today about our discoveries in um, the Athlone Guard Station um, down the road here in, from the castle. Um, I'm delighted to be participating in the events, the Heritage Week events here in Athlone Castle for Heritage Week, and um, I'd like to thank Joanna from the castle for inviting us along. Uh, Joanna, when I agreed to do this talk, I did not envisage it was going to be live streamed. Um, but Joanna has reassured me that everything is going to go fine today and she's put a lot of work into the technology side of all this. So thanks very much, Joanna. Um, so I was invited by Kilcoli Construction to come down and carry out archaeological monitoring on the drainage and services works that had to be put in place behind the existing buildings forming part of the new guard headquarters here in Athlone. Um, so this is a project that they were carrying out on behalf of the Office of Public Works. So we move on to the next slide and I'll just give you a little bit of background to the project. So basically our site was just up around here, just up the road from Athlone Castle, it's down here, and we're right next to the River Shannon, we're on the west side of Athlone Town. And our works commenced in this little laneway here, in between, or sorry, this one here, in between the post office and um, the, the uh, social protection, what was the social protection building, government building, which had lain empty for several years prior to this project commencing. Um, and the guard station was to be, amalg these two buildings here were to be amalgamated. So the drainage works initially were to go in here and around, around the back. So this is where our initial phase of works were focused. So you can see from this map here, we're inside the historic core of Athlone town. This is from the um, National Monument Service, Historic Environment Viewer, and it highlights all the archaeological sites within the town, these little red dots and the blue dots are all the protected structures within the clone. So the, these buildings all along here are all on the record of protected structures, which means they're legally protected buildings. And the red dots identify areas of archaeological potential. These red dots here mark the line of the town boundaries, uh, the clone defences, which date back from the 18th century, possibly earlier. So we were concerned um, that the line of the town defence may cross through this site. Um, there's no, there was no upstanding remains of, of the defences on, on this side of the town, this area. Um, so we did have some concerns on, on the phase two side of works that we would come on the defences. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, you can see this whole area is very, very rich in archaeology and we have the whole castle complex down just down the road here as well. So just to give you a visual of where we are, this is the St. Peter and Paul church just up here. Then this is the post, current post office here. And this is the little laneway here where we commenced our works. And this is the social protection building. And then this is the this was the existing guard station at the, at the time. And to the rear here, you can see the current day costume barracks. Now costume barracks would have originally extended all out into this area. This was all originally part of costume barracks or what would formerly have been known as Victoria barracks. This whole parcel of land was taken back in the 1930s and um, given over to the church for the building of the church and these three government buildings here. Um, so there's been several phases of um, demolition. There was originally um, a, a large block uh, built along here in the 1830s, similar to the block you can see behind it. I think it was a two story block. Um, that was originally just all along here, and there was a gate, I think, roughly around here, going into the going into costume barracks. So this landscape has changed dramatically in the 1930s, um, but we are still we would still be within the footprint of what was costume barracks. So here you can see an aerial view of the site again. We have the castle just down here. We have the river here, the church here, and the whole complex of costume barracks in here right behind us and we're just in this little parcel here and the line of the town defences were believed to have run somewhere up along here along Connolly what's now known as Connolly Street and they would have run past it it's believed that they may have run up along here we think from based on our findings that the 
the town defence, the line with the town defence are probably actually going somewhere along here um, based on findings uh, from previous excavate, exploratory, exploratory test trenches that were put in for previous development down here where um, Malachy Conway found um, some evidence for a large ditch just down here in the car park on the opposite side of the road on Pierce Street. So we think possibly the line of town defences is just outside of where our site was. So we did some background research and luckily there's been some fantastic research compiled on the Athlone town defences and the historic core of the town. So we had um, a lot of great resources we could use to um, get some background and context for our discoveries. So you can see on this map here, Sherard's map from dating from 1784. This is the area of our site just around here. Um, this area, Connolly Street, was known as Pudding Lane here back in 1784. And there's a magazine indicated here. And you can see several small buildings which were part of the initial barracks on Barrack Street. Um, this would have been formed part of the late 17th, early 18th century footprint of the barracks. There's a courtyard area here and several buildings here. This is labelled magazine and this tiny little box up here is labelled an old sentry box on the rampart. The rampart suggests the line of the earthen, large earthen bag that was probably three or four metres high and there might have been a ditch outside it which would have acted as a defensive feature all around, all along this edge of the town. We know on the eastern side of the clone we have fragments of the large town walls that are still intact. On the western side of the town, the defences were mainly earthen, large and large earthen bank, and may even have been set with a hedge on the top to hold it, hold it in place. Um, so we were concerned that we may come across evidence for the earthen banks in here within the footprint of development, just in here, especially when we've seen this um, sentry box on the rampart. So in the next map, we can see here um, that that barracks was, um, that those buildings were demolished and then around, um, let me see, I think it was around 1837, this building here was built, um, Victoria Barracks. This was at this stage it was labelled Victoria Barracks and this was built in 1837. So you can see here we have a far more formalised layout. The church is the church, oh, actually this was an older church I think that formed part of the barracks which was later dismantled and put together in Ballasloe I think. Um, but this this area here is, is the footprint of again where we were doing our excavations of roughly in around this area here and the current street I think is probably further back here today so there was traces of walls found outside here outside the guard station and we think they were probably walls linked to this barracks and you can see that Pudding Row has been renamed Queen Street here and there's these these engineering details the military engineers were compile these incredibly detailed drawings which are available on the military archives website which I'd highly recommend for anyone who's interested in, in the different mapping sources for, for a clone and the layout of military barracks. Um, very, uh, very detailed drawings available. So this this building then built in 1837 um, is probably very similar to some of the buildings that still are still in existence within the footprint of costume barracks today. This building then was demolished in the 1930s to make way for the three buildings I showed you on the previous slide, with the, um, the post office, the social protection building and the guard station. Um, so this building was, was built in 1837, demolished again in the 1930s, so it was around for about 100 years. So here in this image, you can get an idea of what Barrack Street looked like. This is the east end of Barrack Street before all the demolition works took place. So, and you can see there's an entrance here into Costume Barracks. This is the, you can see part of the castle here and we have the River Shannon just here. And then you can see some of the buildings of Costume Barracks in there to the rear. So this building here would have been probably just, you can just see the corner of the building that would have been demolished, which was, this was cutting across the, the footprint of where we were working. Probably looked something a little bit like this here. 
one of the existing buildings within costume parks. So this is um, has some historic plan overlays from the Athlone Town Wall and Defences Conservation Plan. So they had mapped um, projected locations of the town defences based on Philip's map of 1685 and Goubet's map of 1681. So the dark navy dash line we put in here, we thought initially this was the most likely line of the town defences based on um, a wall that was found outside the Garda station here in previous um, archaeological investigations. However, when we did some exploratory work in here in the laneway between the Garda station and the social protection building, we found that this whole area had been disturbed with um, previous um, services, broadband, etc., that had cut in through most of the laneway and we just got a tiny little layer of cobbles just here to one side. And we also did some work here to the rear of the previous guard station and we found that the area again was very disturbed with previous services. So the level of archaeology on this side of the site was, wasn't great. We did get some nice finds that were still um, in the process of um, looking at and compiling reports on. Uh, so most of the work finds on this talk are all from, from this side of the, the development. Um, so we now think after after the work we've compiled on this site that the defences are more likely to be just outside the footprint of the development area here in the junction between Pierce Street and Barrick Street and um, based on Malachy Conway's finding of a possible large ditch features down here in the Pierce Street car park. It seems likely that the, the defence probably follow the line of the existing large wall that divides these two properties here and continues on up to the western side of Costume Barracks. So just to give you an idea of the, um, the sequence of excavation on the site, initially monitoring work started in this little laneway here. Um, these, were two, these are two separate buildings which are being joined together to um, form one large um, big Garda headquarters for, for a clone area. So, Initial works were here in this cutting one and they had to be sequenced in a certain way because of the very tight nature of getting machinery in and out and tradesmen were still working on the refurbishment works in here and the site manager had to try and juggle deliveries etc all around us while we were working in this area. Um, so we commenced here in area one and, um, and the machine started to take off some of the overburden about half a metre below the existing ground level we came on these perfectly preserved cobbled surfaces and again we came on a lovely perfectly preserved area in area two here where the, a large tank was to be put in um, for the as part of the works so these areas three and four here were a lot more disturbed and also right around here there was there was some some survival here in area seven and eight and a little some reasonable survival down here in area five So in this slide here, you can see the initial area that we uncovered was this lovely cobbled surface. You can even see that there's sort of like a path marked in there into the cobbles, that stones are laid out in a different way and there's kind of like a rush along here. So um, a very well preserved surface and we started to get some nice finds from just above the surface and within the cobbles themselves. We got some nice little artefacts which um, confirmed our, our um, Suspicions that we were on quite an early um, 18th century, 17th century layer um, down at this level. Again, you can see the, the well-preserved cobbles. They were set in very compacted layer um, of sand. Um, they were very well set into the ground. Um, and uh, yeah, again, you can see this kind of offsetting either side of the cobbles here. And we had a lot of services cutting through and despite all the demolition and successive phases of building we still had this surface preserved reasonably well. You can see here the footings of a red brick structure. Um, this may have been some sort of internal partition within the original building. This is area two then, this large square area which was really well preserved. Brian O'Hara, who managed a lot of the excavation work on the site, took this lovely overhead shot. You can see there's a hearth in here, little red bricks setting in here. So this seems to have been part of a courtyard area. It's been cut across here by um, a later service, 
but overall it's pretty well intact and we also got some nice finds over in this area. This is a heart also within area two. We got an awful lot of animal bone from within this area here and we'll talk more about the significance of some of the animal bones that were discovered in this area. You can see the guys at work here in the process of excavating the cobbled surface. We have our planning frame down here with a detailed drawing record compiled of all the all the surfaces that were uncovered were carefully removed and various artifacts were uncovered and samples taken at the stage. So this is the um, the other part of the laneway. We had completed works up here and then came back in here into area five and we came across this very large refuse pit in here which had quite an organic um, silty type of fill and we also got some nice artifacts from within this refuse pit here. As you can see here this is a quite large refuse pit um, and we got some good organic material um, preserved within within this pit. We got a nice knife with a bone handle from within this area. So these are two musket balls that were recovered from area one, uh, the, cobble, the first cobbled surface that I would have shown you. So these were um, lead and they would have been used in 18th century flintlock rifles or muskets. Um, and um, the gun would have been fired when the gun powder in the pan was lit by a spark from flint or possibly a chert. We also got a small piece of chert from the phase two excavations, which we think may have been used for this purpose in the muskets. We also got these cutlery items. You can see here what I mean about the organic preservation. We have this lovely wooden handle um, still surviving and this would have been made of iron here, the blade. And we have this fork, uh, again, elements of a wooden handle which still survived. And these both date from the 18th century. We also got various uniform fittings. Uh, you can see this, we think this is probably a shoe buckle and these copper alloy rings which probably form part of the uniform or the, maybe part of the equipment for the horses that were in the barracks. Uh, we've got these lovely little bone buttons and this is a tiny little inscribed um, copper alloy um, mount as well, which would have, probably would have formed part of the uniforms. We'll talk a little bit more about this um, little badge, we think was formed part of a badge that would have been on part of one of the uniforms of the soldiers. Um, we also got these um, 18th century coins, this George II halfpenny coin. You can see the head of George II here with his little bow and his curls at the back. And you see the crown and the harp here and Hibernia inscribed over the, on the coin. Again, we got another George III halfpenny coin dating to 1766. I've just put in an example of a, a better preserved example here where you can see more clearly the, the harp and the crown on the top in Hibernia and the head of George III here on this coin. We also had this very interesting find of um, a bone lice comb, um, which is very, very delicate, but amazingly still survived. So this kind of gives us an indication that there was probably lice infestations were a common problem in the barracks, as is often the case in schools and um, crowded buildings today. Um, it was still a problem for the soldiers back in the 18th century. And we also found a fragment of one of these clay wig curlers. Um, and uh, these would have been used, many of the uh, soldiers at the time would have shaved their heads to try and prevent the lice infestations and they would have worn these grand wigs and they would have boiled the wigs um, in boiling water to kill off the lice and then they would have put these clay wig curlers into an oven and heated them up and wrapped the hair on the wigs around them to give them nice curls when they're heading, heading off out into battle. So this is the badge um, we pointed out earlier, and this was inscribed with 17 LD. So we were a bit mystified as what this may have signified, and we contacted some members of the Sloan Historical Society and um, Garo de Bruyne and Dr. Harmon Murta were very helpful in, in giving us some information on what this 17 LD may have signified. So what they came back with was um, that this was actually 
more than likely um, a piece of the uniform of the 17th Light Dragoons. They were founded in 1759 in Hertfordshire in the UK by Colonel John Hale. So this regiment seen service in Germany in 1761. Um, in 1764, they were based in Ireland and in 1775, they were sent off to the American Revolutionary War before returning again to Ireland until 1795. So this, this regiment seen action in America, Germany, throughout Europe, uh, very well-traveled guys um, that were stationed here in a clone. So they obviously brought trade links and information from the wider world and knowledge um, of military activity in other countries back back to their base in a clone, passed on the knowledge to the other soldiers stationed there. So here we have um, a picture of a 17th Light Dragoons reenactment group in the US who kindly gave me permission to use this picture of them in their uniform. You can see their badges and their fancy cuffs and buttons and um, the, the very um, elaborate nature of the uniforms. Um, so there would have been a lot of maintenance and um, various, various um, fittings to, to go with, with this uniform. Here we have some um, little uh, dress pins that were also uncovered on the site and I believe that these also date to the 18th century. They're wire drawn pins with these little globular heads and the smaller ones would have been used for sewing and mending and the longer ones were used as dress pins to hold ruffs, cuffs and neck cloths on the uniforms. And there's lots of these similar pins found from Rathvarnham Castle in Dublin also from an 18th century context, and you can see this little thimble. So they were very busy um, keeping their uniforms well looked after and maintained as an important part of military life as it is today also. We also got some fragments of this fine glassware, um, which was um, studied by Antoine Giacometti in Archaeology Plan in Dublin. And he identified this as a fine drinking beaker uh, with the cylindrical bodies and uh, estimate this dates from roughly around 1650 to 1670. And um, these glass beakers are quite rare. They're quite rare in Ireland. There's been a few recovered from Kevin Street in Dublin and from Dublin Castle and Church Street. Um, and he said the Kevin Street glasses in Dublin, similar to this, were of Dutch origin and it's quite likely if we did chemical analysis on this we may be able to confirm that this was also of Dutch origin. Um, then also there was two found from King John's Castle in Limerick, so there's not that many of them around. We also have this little file or case bottle dated again to the late 16th to 17th centuries and that was probably used for holding medicines and remedies that the soldiers would have used. Um, also, we got these um, bases of some 17th century wine bottles, uh, which uh, have been dated to this one. This shaft and globe type bottle is dated from roughly 1650 to 1680. So again, quite early finds, given that the initial military activity um, is believed to have been started there or the initial barracks building started around 1690. This suggests there may have been some of the objects and the dates for the objects suggest there may have been military activity there earlier in the 17th century. So um, just move on. So here you can see um, some of the clay pipe fragments that we covered. We've got a lot of clay pipe stems and little clay pipe bowls across the site. These two are also again dated to the 17th century. This one 1640 to 70, a type one spurred clay pipe bowl. And this one here, a flat heel clay pipe bowl, again 1640 to 1660. So they're quite early. We have this little clay pipe stem stamped with meerschaum on it. Um, meerschaum is a mineral from Turkey and it would have been used for making pipes in fine workshops all around Europe. Um, so again, indicating wide trade links amongst the, the sto soldiers stationed here in 17th and 18th century Athlone. Uh, we have this little pipe stem with the Freemasonry symbol of the crossed compass and plumb bob. And these pipes were manufactured in Glasgow and Belfast. 
And we had a very unusual discovery. We collected all the animal bone that we um, uncovered on the site and sent it to our zoo archaeologist, Siobhan Duffy, who went through it in great detail. And she made this very interesting discovery of some, there were several male chicken leg bones identified, uh, mainly from that kind of courtyard square area in area two that I showed you early on. And uh, in that hearth area, there were several small male chicken leg bones um, discovered in there and one of them had a sawn off spur which indicates that um, artificial spurs were attached um, which would have been the case when they were engaged in cockfighting tournaments with the male chickens. Um, the male birds if they're confined in a small space if they if they fight in the wild one of them will lose the battle and fly away but in a small space where they're tethered um, the male birds will fight each other to the death and this would have been a popular pastime in the 18th century. You can see here an illustration with all the men around um, cheering on. It was a popular gambling activity. Um, they were often brutal, ending in the death of the losing bird. And a lot of the 18th century newspapers advertised these tournaments. And they were often attended by the gentry. The sport was often encouraged amongst uh, schoolboys and soldiers to encourage um, valour, um, the spirit of fighting to the death in, in battle. Um, so it was sort of considered a suitable pastime for soldiers. So just to summarise some of the significance of the findings, the early dating of some of the artefacts suggests that there was possibly a military presence on the site from the mid 1650s. Um, the Construction of the barracks is currently dated around 1691. Some of the artefacts then discovered they point to concerns with the uniform and the dress, lots of dress pins and uniform fittings. So they obviously had to keep their uniforms well maintained and looking very presentable. Um, also concerns with hygiene, the bone lice comb and the wig curler suggests the shaved heads and the use of fashionable wigs, which are also known about from the time. And we have examples of that here in Athlone Castle of the uniforms and outfits that the soldiers would have worn. Um, lots of clay pipes also found suggesting tobacco, tobacco is popular and glass bottles for alcohol and medicinal purposes. Evidence for gambling on blood sports. And um, these give us an insight into the everyday activities of the barracks in the late 17th and 18th centuries. And then the, some of the links, the trade links, suggest the soldiers had um, connections with far-flung far -flung battles and trade links. So the overall significance, um, we did expect to find, as I said earlier, traces of the town defences um, on the western side of the site. And we did a lot of exploratory works, but no, no traces were found. Uh, so we've concluded from this that they were either any evidence may have been destroyed, destroyed during demolition, the different phases of demolition, construction and later services that have been put in over the last number of years, or the, the, the other possibility, which we think might be quite likely, is that the defences actually exist outside, just outside the curtilage of the site to the west. Um, and there might be traces to be found um, in the car park of the now empty Bank of Ireland, which is just adjacent to the guard station site. And there's a substantial wall running along here, which was probably originally part of the whole costume barracks, originally Victoria barracks complex. And this wall may form part of um, maybe sitting on the line of what would have been the um, 18th, 17th, 18th century town defences. Um, we did a background search just to see if there was many other excavations on military barracks throughout Ireland. There have been a few small uh, um, excavations. Some of them are of quite a lot later date. Um, there doesn't seem to have been any excavation of a barracks um, dating to the um, 17th, 18th centuries. This would be one of the earliest um, earliest barracks founded and um, the evidence is quite early. There have been other um, fantastic findings on different military sites such as at La Town, and there's been various community projects carried out focusing on military activity. But as far as we can make out, this is um, the first excavation of an early barracks. Um, 
the Collins Barracks in Dublin claims to be the oldest continuously occupied barracks in the world, and that was built in 1702. But our evidence and research suggests that Sloan's Custom Barracks could probably challenge this claim um, because there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest it's, it's a good bit earlier. Um, and then at a national level, Victoria Barracks now, Custom Barracks played and continues to play a highly significant role in Irish military history. And uh, the next slide you'll see here the Irish soldiers marching across the bridge in Athlone for the handover of Custom Barracks in 1922. This is after 230 years of British um, British occupation in the barracks and they had laid out the barracks, their engineers had, had set up the, the construction of the whole complex and the layout and they had laid the groundwork for a modern military army in Ireland um, and that tradition we see is still continued on here in the Clone where there's still quite a large military presence in the town and it's um, fitting that this, this work has been done coming up to the 100 year centenary of the, the Irish um, moving into the, into the barracks here in Athlone. So if this talk has um, piqued your interest in um, the military history in Athlone, I've just added a few links here that might be worth a look. Um, the Military Archives, fantastic resource, um, all about the military history and um, the mapping and the engineering works around the construction of the barracks. Um, then we also came across, across this Army Barracks of 18th Century Ireland project in UCD um, and we contacted them and they were very helpful with advice on this project. The Old Clone Society who have amazing resources up on their website about the history of the town and again also incredibly helpful to us while we were compiling our work on this project. Um, the original work um, on the town defences of a clone was originally done by John Bradley back in 1993 for the Urban Archaeological Survey and this work has laid the groundworks in preserving and conserving the, the, the defences around a clone and um, the Irish Historic Towns Atlas has followed on from this and this is also a fantastic resource with lovely maps of the layout of a clone town down through the ages and also the clone town walls and and Defence's Conservation Plan is a great booklet um, that we found very useful also. Um, so I'd just like to finish with thanking all the people who helped me with this project, particularly Brian O'Hara, who um, carried out a lot of the excavation site works for me, and um, he had a fantastic team with them as well, Michal Ford, Niall Jones, Paul Manham, and Maria Coleman, and all the specialists who carried out, helped us with identifying various um, aspects around the finds and also we'd like to thank uh, the staff of Kilcoley Construction, uh, particularly the site manager at the time, Sarah Crosby, who had to um, reschedule a lot of works around us and helped out with the logistics of um, works on the site. And we'd like to thank Garrett O'Brien and Dr. Harmon, Mer Her Her Dr. Harmon Murta um, for their expertise on the local military history and Ivor McGrath and UCD who gave me some advice on my report. Um, also particularly like to thank Elaine Hanna in the Office of Public Works who um, gave us support and the funding for this project came from the Office of Public Works and Kilcoley Construction. Uh, thanks for listening to our talk today and we hope to be back soon to discuss, um, have a quick look at some of the objects which we've brought along with us here today to the Garda station or to the to the castle. So we'll take a quick look at them. We'll be back to you in a few minutes. And if anyone has any questions, we'll, we'll do our best to answer them then. Thank you.